So um, professionals in any field after a point um, need feedback in order to learn to keep improving, to push themselves, to move beyond their comfort zone. Athletes get to watch themselves on video to sort of hone their technique. Now school districts around the country, especially in the last 10 years, have been assembling student achievement data, tracking, doing, calculating, for instance, value-added models for tracking teacher impacts on kids. And as important as that is, and as useful as that is, it's not enough. We designed the Measures of Effective Teaching Project to try to identify some additional tools beyond just test scores that could be useful for providing feedback um, uh, for teaching. So many of the folks who were just standing had been developing uh, instruments for doing classroom observations or student surveys over time. And our goal in this project was to apply them in a large scale way and test under, you know, under what conditions those kinds of measures can be providing, you know, meaningful, meaningful data. So the whole point of the project was to fill out the portfolio, not just have student achievement gains, but to have other things. Now, there's, um, there are only a few, different, um, if, once you start to think about the problem, how can we m provide feedback on teaching that's not just limited to student achievement gains, there are only a few places you can go. One is to try to do classroom observations better. So in the project, we're uh, testing out five different instruments for doing classroom observations. Some. Um, uh, not subject specific, some subject specific. We also thought we'd try student surveys because I'm a, I'm a college professor. It's ubiquitous in higher education. That's the primary way that we evaluate instruction in higher education. I'm not saying it's always perfect, but we thought let's try that in K-12 and just, and, but let's see whether it's valid and reliable. Uh, finally, we, we're, we are including value-added measures. We did also ask teachers to take a test of pedagogical content knowledge. I'm not going to be talking about those results today. That'll be in our final report when, when, uh, when we report out in mid-2012. The other thing that was uh, unique about the project was just its scale. So there were nearly 3,000 teacher volunteers from districts around the country that were, that were willing to um, come help us in, in this research. We scored more than, for this study that I'll be talking about today, we scored more than uh, 7,500 um, lessons at least three times. So we're analyzing results from more than 22,000 um, scores. Uh, there were ETS, our partners in this work, I see Tom Van Essen and Catherine McClellan in, in the audience, recruited and trained more than 900 people to apply these five different instruments for doing the observations. And the reason why we did that was we didn't just want to know whether the instrument developers themselves could identify effective teaching. We wanted to know whether we could take those descriptions and see whether they were clear enough that we could train up a, a group of folks that had a background in teaching, so most of these 900 folks had a background in teaching, to recognize effective teaching themselves. So we didn't want to just test whether the experts could do it, we wanted to test whether real people with, with, um, with I mean, not that the experts aren't real people, too, but um, uh, 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 mere mortals uh, could, could apply the, the instruments. 
and, and we had student achievement uh, data and student surveys included in this report from more than 44,000 kids. Um, now, the other thing that's unique about this study is that we're looking at a range of different student outcomes. So we're looking at gains on the state math tests, gains on the state ELA tests. But we had a unique opportunity to look at other student outcomes, too. So we had uh, students take um, uh, the balanced assessment in math, which tests conceptual understanding in math and not just ability to do math operations. In English language arts, kids took an open-ended version of the Stanford 9 reading test. Now, you might say, Stanford 9? Well, this is not your grandmother's Stanford 9. This is, this is a, uh, a test where kids have to write short answer responses to reading comprehension questions. Um, so it's quite different from, in format from many of the state ELA tests. Finally, we also looked at some other student outcomes, like um, student reported effort. Like I, so we asked students, do you agree, disagree? I did my best work in this class all year long. And even just kids' enjoyment from being in a particular teacher's class. So, do you agree, disagree, this class is a happy place for me to be? Now, we're not proposing that those would be used, those outcomes would be used for an accountability purpose, but we just wanted to see, given that we had a chance to collect those outcomes, whether there was any trade-off between the types of outcomes you could imagine using and those other outcomes that you know parents care about, but which are just, you know, harder to measure and harder to include in an accountability system. We just wanted to see where, what we found there. Now, um, in the uh, presentation today, I'm going to be focusing on uh, three things. First, I'll talk about what we've learned. Um, we've still got a lot to learn, but, but I'll talk about what we've learned so far about what it takes to do a high-quality classroom observation. Um, next, I'll talk about the, the power of combining the different measures, so combining observations with student surveys and, and value added, because each, it turns out, has different strengths and weaknesses. And then finally, I wanted to talk about Compared to what? So all of these, none of these measures are perfect, um, but better information, even if imperfect, should lead to better decisions. So, so we're going to show what were the differences in student outcomes for teachers who scored well on, on these measures uh, that combine observations, student surveys, and value added. What was the difference in their outcomes when you use that versus the outcomes when you use the information the school systems are currently using, master's degrees and experience? Because that's the right comparison. We can all think of mistakes that will be made with these measures. We can all think of things that they're not capturing or not measuring and ways that they could be manipulated. But the question ought to be, do they provide better information than the information we're currently making decisions on? That's the right criterion. So we'll have a few slides at the end that focus on that. Okay, so um, section one, just on the four steps to high quality observations. <coughs> if I can move forward. All right, so the first step is just defining clear expectations for, for uh, teachers. Um, here's the distribution of actual uh, scores across the 7,500 uh, lessons on one of the instruments, uh, uh, the Danielson Framework for Teaching. And in the version of the framework for teaching that we used for this study, there were eight competencies. 
One thing to notice is that um, there were very few people uh, either at the unsatisfactory end or the distinguished end on any of the competencies, that most of the action was between two and three, between uh, basic and proficient um, uh, on, on the framework. The second thing is I just wanted to call out for people the specific language on one of those competencies um, using questioning and discussion techniques. So, if all of these instruments, the real challenge is, okay, if somebody's going to walk into a classroom, there are a million potential things you could notice. So I've got a 11-year-old boy who's got ADHD, he, he would notice lots and lots of things if he walked into a classroom. So it would be important for him to be able to say, here's the set of things to focus on, here's the set of things to look for. And each of these instruments have, represent a set of hypotheses about what you ought to tell people to look for when they walk into the classroom. So here were the eight different competencies to look for, and then here are performance levels on, on one of them, the, the using questioning and discussion techniques. And you would get a low score, an unsatisfactory score, on that competency if the observer saw you ask a series of yes-no questions, and if the teacher did all the mediating of, of the questions, so if all the all the prompts came from and back to the teacher. If just a few students in the classroom were involved in, in the questions. Now, you'd get a high score, an advanced score on this competency if the questions asked students to explain their understanding, to explain the, how they came up with a particular answer. If the students started to initiate some of the questions, and better yet, if the students started to ask each other questions, and if most of the students in the class were involved in the questions. So that would get you a, a high score, an advanced score. Now, two things to notice about that. One is that that necessarily involves judgment. This is not a checklist. You can train people, but trained people will still have somewhat different judgments. It's unavoidable. The only way to avoid it would be to focus on trivial things, like did class start on time? Did class end on time? Was the teacher wearing a tie? Those kinds of things you can, don't require judgment, you could get 100% reliability on, but probably don't matter that much. The things that matter for teaching are the things that will require judgment. That's the first thing to notice, and, and you'll see in a second, that's reflected in some of our results. The second thing to notice about this is that it will depend on the lesson. So I'm teaching this semester, and I guarantee you, the first three or four days of class, I will not get out of unsatisfactory on this. Because the, the type of material I'll be teaching those first three or four days of class is methodological. It's, um, I'm just trying to establish a common vocabulary, and I'm going to go fast and hard, and my students will feel like they're drinking from a fire hose. But just in the, in the, in the way I've done that in, in the past, that is the best way to teach that initial material. But later in the semester, hopefully, if I've, done, if I've gotten people using the same language, we will have much more meaningful uh, discussion. So later in the semester, hopefully, I'll be mostly proficient, maybe on a good day, advanced. So the second thing to notice is this is going to vary from lesson to lesson, and we see evidence of that too. So um, the second thing uh, to, to 
uh, to focus on is just ensuring accuracy of observers. The way we handled that in the project was that, um, was that after people received, I, I think the, the average was 27 to 35 hours worth of, of training on the instruments. It varied by instrument. Uh, we showed people videos that had been pre-scored by people who were expert on the particular instrument. And only if the raters could score those videos with a minimum number of discrepancies were they allowed to score um, uh, in our study. Now, we're trying to make it easy for school systems to do something very similar. So this summer, we're going to be, um, uh, will be available to some of our uh, uh, closest partners, something we're calling the Raider um, certification tool, where we'll have videos from the Measures of Effective Teaching Study, and there'll be software attached so that you know, they're not going to come pre-scored from us. You would have to have your experts pre-score them. Ideally, it'd be great if you could have a, a lot of your teachers do the pre-scoring. And then only if the raters, once they've received training, want, if they can achieve some minimum level of, of accuracy, would they be allowed to proceed to go do observations. So, so um, we're going to be doing that, um, but we know that there's, there are a number of other providers that are starting to offer that kind of service too, and I think it'll be important to have some process for ensuring accuracy before people start to, start to score. A third step um, is for just monitoring reliability. Now, at the end of training, and even after people were certified, we didn't assume that they were going to be able to score well. That would have been silly to, to, to assume that because you don't know, and that would be particularly true in a real school system because once people have walked out of the training, they're walking in, especially if they're observing in classrooms of people they know and either like or dislike, you know, bias can go in either direction. They could, you could have people who could pass the accuracy and be certified but still not be able to score reliably. So the only way to tell is to do, um, well, what we did there was we took a random sample of the videos and we had them scored twice. And we could compare the different scores to tell us something about the amount of reliability. And we had the same teacher, because they taught more than one lesson, we could see how scores varied from lesson to lesson. We could actually even see how scores varied from section to section, because the teachers in the study, if they taught two sections of the same course, had video from both sections. So we could see how did scores vary depending on the group of students the teacher was standing in front of. And what we learned in the process was that if we just took one Raider score based on one lesson, and th th these numbers are, are for the framework for teaching instrument um, that, that we use, but it's similar f for uh, uh, the other four instruments that, that, that we tested. Only about a third, 37% of the variance in the scores from the one observation represented consistent aspects of, of teacher's practice. The rest was other things. The rest was rater judgment. It was also importantly lesson to lesson variance. So it wasn't just about rater judgment, it was that that teacher would have been different if he showed up on a different day because the material was going to be different. So, um, so only about a third um, of the variance, if you just focus on one score, was due to um, 
due to consistent aspects of practice. Now, there are two things you can do if you see reliability numbers that are low like that. So 37% is not good, at least for making high stakes decisions. There are two things you could do. One, you could go back and dumb down the instrument. Say, well, well let's go pay, let's focus on the things where um, there'll be 100% reliability. You know, let's focus on the things like did class start on time, or was the person wearing a tie? But a second thing you could do, I think that would be a mistake, by the way, because you'd be focusing on the stuff that matters less. The second thing you could do is say, well, why don't we take a few different, let's observe more than one lesson, and maybe let's get more than one person involved in doing the observations, and let's average them, and then ask, how much of the variation in that average represents consistent aspects of a teacher's practice? Now, when we did that, we found that by the time we observed four different lessons, each by a different rater, it was then that we got to the point where more than two-thirds of the variance was represented consistent aspects of teacher's practice. Now, I just felt like a change in the energy level in this room, because I could imagine people were saying, wait a minute, we're trying to do this, you know. I'm not saying that, that it's got to be, you're going to have to do four observations by, uh, by diff and use a different rater each time. Because there were things that were unique about our study. Our folks are watching digital video. They're not physically present in the classroom. That probably lowered the reliability. Our folks didn't know anything about the context in the schools. They just saw a video. That also probably lowered reliability. But there were other things that probably increased our reliability, and that was that people had no personal relationship with the people they're observing. So it's hard to tell. It's impossible for us to say how many observations you're going to have to do to achieve reasonable levels of reliability, but we can say that it's important to know what kind of reliability you're achieving, and so you could do something very similar to what we did for determining reliability. You could draw a representative sample of, of teachers. You could do it as a random sample, or you could do it some other way, as long as it's a representative group of, of teachers in your district. Doesn't have to be every teacher in the district, although some districts are already deciding to use impartial observers for all. Say you just pulled 100 teachers at random from your district, you sent out impartial observers to go out and do another observation, and then compare the score from that additional observation with the official scores that you've got, and that'll we actually show in the research report that's available. We've got some copies in the back. It's available on our website. We, we even give you the calculation that you would have to do with those numbers for calculating reliability. And that'll give you a sense for what kind of, of reliability you're achieving in practice. Again, because it's different from just being able to certify that people can use the instrument, which is important too. But you want to know in practice what kind of reliability are you having. And even just 100 people would, would give you an estimate of what kind of reliability you're achieving at the system overall. Now, it wouldn't go, that's not enough to tell you school by school what kind of reliability you have, but, but it'll tell you something about how the system overall is functioning. Now, Next, <clears throat> it's important to verify alignment with outcomes. So the whole point in doing this, let's remember, is to help teachers help students learn more. So if there's no, if the folks who are getting higher scores on the observation are not 
necessarily getting larger student achievement gains, at least on average, then the classroom observation is not going to be very useful to achieve that goal, right? So it's important to at least check whether, whether there is some alignment between the classroom observation and the other outcomes. Now, what I'm plotting here, um, I realize it may be hard for some people to read, uh, on the x-axis is the percentile score on each of these observation instruments. So um, uh, FFT is Framework for Teaching, uh, CLASS uh, is Bob Pianta's class rubric, MQI is the Mathematical Quality of Instruction, UTOP is the You Teach Teacher Observation Protocol, and Plato uh, in the bottom two graphs is the, um, the Protocol for Language Arts Teacher Observation that uh, Pam Grossman at Stanford developed. So each of those instruments has a different scale. Some are four-point scale, some are seven-point scale. So we put them all in percentile units to make it easier to see. So that's along the x-axis. And on the y-axis is value added, converted into um, uh, months of learning uh, units. So three things to notice in, in, from those four graphs. One, all the slopes are up. That's a good thing. Right? It'd be bad if it were flat or even worse if it were down. That, that, and all of them are statistically significant and, 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 and positive. So, so on all of the instruments that we looked at, folks who had higher scores on the instruments were seeing higher value added on all of the different outcomes we looked at, value added on the state test as well as value added on the supplemental assessment. So on the left-hand side are the state tests in the top, state math and the bottom state ELA. And on the right-hand side, on the top is the balanced assessment in math and uh, on the right at the bottom is Stanford 9 op open-ended. So the first thing to notice is the slopes are up. The second thing to notice is not a dramatic difference uh, between them. Uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm sure in some of them there were, there were differences, but mostly when I looked at that, I, I saw mostly similarity rather than differences. So each of the instruments had about the same relationship to these outcomes as the others. The third thing to notice, and this was sort of a surprise, well, partially it wasn't a surprise, um, was that all of these slopes are flatter on the state ELA test. Now, this is a very common finding. If you go to the What Works Clearinghouse, if you could find any intervention that's had an impact, eight times out of 10, it's had an impact in math and not ELA. This is a thing, a finding that people have been seeing over time. I'm even used to seeing it in the teacher data. There few, there's less heterogeneity in student achievement gains in different teachers' classrooms in ELA than in math, and less payoff to experience typically in ELA than in math. So I was used to thinking that this was just about literacy, and I think a lot of people think that, that, oh, literacy is something you learn at home. It's not something you learn at school. Math, you only learn at school. I think that's wrong, actually, or I'm beginning to think that's wrong. Because on the right, on the bottom, you see the Plato, uh, I mean the, the Stanford 9 open-ended test, and the relationships we saw there between observations and student achievement gains were much like we saw in math. Now, what's unique about, what's different about the Stanford 9 open-ended is it requires kids to write short answer questions. And one possibility, this is a hypothesis I've, to, explain this, it's not a hypothesis we've been able to test yet, but, but one hypothesis that would be consistent with that is that, well gosh, outside of the first 
you know, three years of schooling, teachers aren't mostly teaching reading comprehension anymore. They're teaching writing, starting to teach writing. They're, they're um, uh, you know, teaching literature, forms of literature. So it may just be that the state ELA tests, which almost uniformly, not completely, but are primarily multiple choice questions following uh, reading comprehension um, uh, passages that, that kids are, are expected to read and understand. It may be that those assessments are less sensitive to teaching effects than assessments that involve more writing um, and, and other. And so it could be that, that as these new Common Core assessments come online, those will be like the open-ended version of the Stanford 9 we're seeing, more sensitive and show to teacher effects than, than the state ELA tests we, we have now. So now I want to talk about uh, the, the power of combining measures. Now, I have a six-year-old boy, um, so forgive me for this, using this analogy, dynamic uh, trio. Um, he understands in a really, really profound way that if you're going to have a team of superheroes, they better not all have the same superpowers. <laughs> Doesn't that make some sense? Like, you don't want three Supermans. You want a Superman, like a, maybe a Batman, and maybe a, like a Wonder Woman, you know, like you, or somebody, it'd be great if one of them could make themselves invisible. Yeah, um, so, these measures are like that too. They have different strengths and weaknesses. It's silly to be thinking about which one is better because there are different dimensions to worry about. So, um, when we were comparing these measures, we did the following thing. We said, okay, let's measure let's collect this measure of effective teaching when the teacher was working with one group of students, and then let's see what those measures say about their likely success when they're working with another group of, of students. So we measure effective teaching in, with one group of students, and we look at outcomes when they're working with another group of students. Often, just another section in the same year, sometimes just student achievement gains from the, from the prior year. And we compare the measures on three different um, criteria. One, just predictive power. So which of these, of these measures, the classroom observation, the student survey, the gains on the state tests, value added, or a combination of the above, were most predictive of which teachers were more likely to have positive student outcomes with another group of kids. So that was one of the criteria. And by the way, that is the thing that we want principals or other supervisors making decisions to, to be focused on is, is to say, okay, what does this set of evidence that we have that includes past history of student achievement gains but includes observations and student surveys, what does this set of evidence that we have say about this teacher's likely success with another group of students? That's the, that's the, the thinking that, that, that we hope principals and supervisors have, and so we mimic that in our, in our own analysis. We said we measured teaching with one group, and we said how well does that predict outcomes with another group? The second criterion we used was reliability, and by that I mean lack of volatility. So, um, so something is re reliable if it's not likely to be different if you're working with a different group of, of, of students or trying to measure this in a different year. It's one minus volatility is reliability. Um, and then the third criterion, which is mostly is just potential at this point, is the potential for diagnostic insight. Which of these measures are more likely to be able to help teachers identify what they need to work on? 
Okay, so these are three different things. Now, unfortunately, this diagnostic insight right now is just potential because, you know, we don't have evidence yet about whether when you provide this back, you can actually change practice and then change effects on student outcomes. So it's a, it's a potential right now, but it's a really important potential because that's why we're, it's a big part of why we're all here. Okay, so um, what did we find? Remember this, the superpower analogy. So it turns out for value added, or student achievement gains, its superpower is predictive power. So if you're trying to identify which teachers are most likely to have success when working with another group of students, the measure that has the greatest predictive power among these three is, is value added. But a weakness, or a relative weakness, is reliability. It's value added measures bounce around from year to year. Now you might say, how is that consistent? Well, if value added didn't bounce around from year to year, if it was 100% reliable, it would be 100% predictive. The fact that it bounces around some from year to year means it's not 100% predictive. And potential for diagnostic insight with value added is very low. It's just telling you whether things are going up or things are going down. It's not telling you what you might do differently to try to change your practice. So, so potential for diagnostic insight is value added's kryptonite. Okay, so student survey. One of the surprising things, and this was a surprise for us. It, so student survey does have medium predictive power. Not as high as value added, but, but uh, substantial. But among the measures we looked at, it was the most reliable. Now, when I started, I wouldn't have said, oh yeah, that's what we're gonna find. Student achievement, the student survey here is gonna be the most reliable measure you have. But in retrospect, it makes it, it, it actually makes some sense. Because remember, what were the two main sources of lower reliability in the observation. One was judgment, right? So any individual child is not gonna be as good a judge or won't be as reliable as a well-trained adult. But you got 35 of them, not just four or one. So, so the power of averaging helps. And the second, remember, the second source of reliability challenge was lesson to lesson variation. So even if you do four different observations, you're in there for four days in the year, whereas the youth are there for 180 days. So, um, so what we found was actually that what the students are saying about a given uh, teacher is more consistent across different groups of, from, from section to section, or, uh, than many of the other measures um, uh, we, we look at. Okay, third, um, the observation. Has predictive power, as we saw from the earlier uh, graph, but it's, it's lower. Than it, than it is for the student survey or the, or the, uh, or the value added measure. Reliability could be medium or high depending upon the number of observations you do. If you do four or five observations, each by a different observer, then you're gonna be more in the range of where the, the student surveys are. But if you do less than that, you probably, it'll be medium. Now, the superpower for the observation is a potential superpower, and that is this potential for diagnostic insight. Because the observation, because it's based on a profession, trained professional going in to do an observation, if that person is doing it with accuracy and reliability and is well-trained, there's a much higher potential 
that the professional, the, the teacher will take that feedback and, and try to work on, on, on some things. Okay, now here's one other graph uh, that for a geek like me, I like when, I, when it popped up on the screen, I got all excited, so let me see if I can get you excited too. So the two axes here are on the X, on the horizontal axis is reliability. On the vertical axis is um, predictive power. It's the difference in math value added for the people who are in the top 25% versus the bottom 25% on that measure. Now, this, um, let me see, this um, dot um, here uh, is for the observation alone. Uh, so, m medium reliability, uh, you know, lower predictive power. If you look at the student survey alone, medium predictive power, so medium on that axis, but high on reliability. The value added is the highest in predictive power, but lower on reliability than the student survey alone. Now those two blue dots up here are what you get when you combine them. One of them is when you combine them just with equal weights. One of them is when you combine them with what we're calling criterion-based weights, where you choose the weights that would maximize the predictive power. And the point is that by combining, you can get more of both. By combining, you can get more of both things that you want. Predictive power and reliability. Okay. Um, next, I just want to talk about the compared to what question, because again, you're gonna, we're gonna see lots of stories in the papers I'm sure many of you probably already have, of implementation challenges in the first year of, of Race to the Top or implementing this classroom observation or, or, or anything. And there'll be the story about the, you know, the teacher of the year or the, everybody's favorite teacher at the school that doesn't do well on the observation. And clearly, some of those will have been uh, mistakes. Impossible to know which ones, though, actually, unfortunately. And so, because you can't know for sure which ones, you ought to be asking, okay, on average, do I think that the information we're using now is better than the old information we were using? Master's degrees and experience. Because in the past, Compensation and even um, retention decisions have been mo based on those two things, master's degrees and, and experience. And so we just wanted to see, all right, on these various outcomes that we're measuring, how well does this combined measure, combining classroom observations, student survey and value added, do relative to master's degrees and experience? Now, on the left, we first just look at state math value added. On the right is state ELA. On the state math value added, the way to read that is the darker orange bar says that the top 25% teachers on that combined measure that combines observation student surveys and value added gained four and a half months relative to the average teacher in, in, um, in uh, the study. The bottom quarter, the students assigned to the bottom quarter teachers lost 3.1 months. So the difference between the top and the bottom quartile there was 7.6 months, almost a whole school year. Now the differences were smaller on the state ELA uh, tests. I'll show you the Stanford 9 in a second. 
Now, look, master's degree on top, experience is the second panel there. Small differences, in fact, they're not statistically significant. So, on those outcomes, the combined measures did much better. Now, to some extent, that's not a huge surprise because value added on the state test was one of the things, not in the same classroom, in a different classroom, but it was one of the things that was being used to do the, to do the prediction. So to some extent, that's not a, super, a great surprise. So what about the other outcomes? So we looked at um, student achievement gains on the balanced assessment in math in Stanford 9. For the people, again, this is measured the same way, top, bottom, quartile, and the combined measure, which only uses the state test to do the value added. And again, larger differences in the bottom than in for master's degrees or experience. And in fact, three out of those four differences were not statistically significant for master's degrees or experience. So now I'm not saying that the te all the teachers who were getting high value added on the state math test were the same as the teachers that were getting high value added on the supplemental assessments. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're correlated, actually. I'm saying that, 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 that there's, a, there's, a, there's overlap. It's not 100%, but the overlap is a lot higher when you're using value added on the state test than when you're using master's degrees or experience. So again, the question shouldn't be, can I think of an outcome that is not included in my measure? The question should be, do I think that outcome would be more correlated with the information I'm already using, master's degrees and experience, than with the state math test. And what this is saying, at least on these outcomes, no. Now, on the last one, we, we also just look at student effort and student attachment to school. So those are the, these are the squishier outcomes. But even on those, the teachers who were scoring higher on this combined measure had better outcomes on those in another class of students, not the same class of students, in another class of students than, than, um, than the folks, um, than master's degrees or experience. And again, all, all, none of those four are statistically significant. These four, two at the bottom are statistically significant. All right, so I want to leave some time for questions. So I um, just give a quick, uh, um, preview of timing of the rest of our reports. So we've got two more reports coming out in 2012. I've been warned not to give a particular month uh, <laughs> because that tends to get us in trouble. But, um, but actually I think this summer is realistic. We're, we're on track. Both of these analyses are already underway and uh, they're sort of moving on parallel tracks, but <clears throat> one will focus on the weighting issue, which many of you are struggling with, and there, we're not going to be saying, here's the right answer to the weighting question. Rather, we're going to say, here are some different rationales for making weighting decisions. So if you want to maximize predictive power, here's the weights you might use. If you were trying to maximize reliability, Here's some of the weights you might use. If you're trying to maximize some weighted combination of predictive power and reliability, here are the weights that you might want to use. So we're not going to be making recommendations about a particular weighting scheme. Rather, we're going to be looking at what are some different rationales and what would be the implications of those rationales. Um, then the final report will be the report using the random assignment from the second year. Uh, so we'll be saying, okay, if you take these measures from the first year and identify effective teachers, people might still worry that, hey, wait a minute, are there student characteristics you haven't controlled for? Well, 
we can only control for the, the ones that we're measuring. The only way to resolve that is to say, well, let's randomly as, uh, assign and see what the outcomes were. So, so we'll have a final report that'll be focusing on, okay, what did the random assignment results say about, um, about the pr predictive power? Now, in this sense, final is a bit of a misnomer because we've made a grant to the University of Michigan to place all these data from, from the project. There, all the videos, all the student outcomes, all the everything. And what we're hoping happens is that lots of other researchers will use it and not just use it, I mean, <laughs> lots of other researchers, not just to do silly studies that nobody cares about. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully to do studies that would be helpful to you so that they'll be able to watch, they'll be able to develop the next version of these instruments. So if, if, if um, Charlotte has ideas about how to make some changes to framework for teaching or if Bob Pianta on class had some idea or uh, any of the teams um, had ideas about how to change their instruments, these videos will be available there and could be rescored and then checked against the student achievement outcomes and checked for reliability. So, so hopefully this is just the first step and there'll be a lot of other studies coming along later that will be pushing this field further and refining these instruments further um, going forward. Now, just the last um, reminder of, of the, um, if I can get this thing to go ahead one more, uh, the resources that, um, that I've, I've mentioned. You know, first, the observation instru instruments. Many of the developers of the observation instruments are here today if you want to talk to them about, about their instruments. Um, the student surveys. Um, there's a MET version of the tripod survey uh, that is a shorter version. It's not the complete tripod um, that, that um, you could uh, get access to. Uh, I think at the, I think we've got something at the MET project website or Ron Ferguson, maybe Ron you want to stand up? Ron Ferguson developed the tripod survey, which is our student survey, and Ron is here uh, today if you want to touch base with, with him. Um, the Raider certification software, our version, as I said, will, you know, um, that we're working with it, uh, Dennis Newman from Empirical Education, who I think is here uh, today too. Um, uh, will be available uh, this summer, but I know that there are others who are working on similar uh, products. I think uh, Charlotte and, um, and ETS um, has a product there. I think TAP, the NIET folks have a product there. So hopefully today you can talk to some people who could help with that if you have an interest in that. And then finally, just a final resource is this reliability check that I talked about how you might be able to draw a random sample of teachers, get a set of impartial observers to go out and use that to judge whatever reliability you're getting. There's a calculation showing how you could use those scores to calculate reliability in the research report. There are some copies in the back, um, but it'll be available at the, at the MET Project website.